Welcome to morning worship. We invite you to sing with the choir and the children as they process. Hark the herald angel sing. I'll ask that you stand as well as we sing. Good morning. How are you this morning? Great, great. You fought through the 40 days of rain and the fog, and you are here. And that's really what worship is for us this morning. Uh, we need to know as we gather together that the Lord Jesus Christ is not having an off day. The Lord Jesus Christ desires to lift our eyes, to get our heads above the clouds, and to see that he is always happy and joyful and full of grace. And so this morning, no matter how you might have come into worship, um, his promise to us is that he is here to meet us with compassion and nearness and the fullness of joy in his presence. And so for all who are weary in a weary world and need a reason to rejoice, for all who mourn and long for comfort, for all who feel maybe invisible to the God of the universe, to those who fail and desire strength from on high, and to everyone who sins and needs a Savior, you are welcomed into joyful worship this morning with a welcome that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we open our doors wide to you because Jesus Christ has opened wide his arms to you. We begin this morning with a call to worship taken from Scripture. Uh, if you would, just stand with me and join with me. There are words on the screen. I'll read the portions in white. If you'll join in the portions printed in yellow, perhaps you recognize where this comes from in Scripture. 
the angel who announced the birth of Jesus Christ declared, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. No bad news on earth can stop the good news of Jesus Christ from getting through. No despair in the world can outmatch the great joy that Jesus gives. Therefore, we will gladden our hearts with his good news today. The Lord be with you. Let us worship God. Now, as the Lord has welcomed us into worship this morning, we have an opportunity. We call it passing the peace. And the idea is that as Christ has made peace with you through his cross, we also welcome one another into worship in peace and welcome them into worship with gladness. So I take a few moments right where you are, move around a bit as well, and greet one another. Good morning, boys and girls. So I'd like for you to look at the picture on the screen. What does that make you think of? What do you think of when you see a crown with jewels, a king, a royal king? Where does a king usually live? In a palace or a castle. And I would imagine that a king would probably sleep on a fancy bed like that one, wouldn't you think? Probably so. Well, the Bible tells us that Jesus is a king. In fact, he is the king of kings. He is Lord over everything. But even though Jesus is the king of kings, He wasn't born like other kings. He wasn't born in a palace or a castle. He was born in a stable. He didn't have a king's fancy bed to sleep in when he was born. He slept in an animal's feeding trough. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. God, who made the universe with just a word, came to earth as a little baby. He came to earth not to wear a fancy king's crown, but to one day wear a crown of thorns and to take the punishment for our sins. He died so we can have forgiveness and eternal life with him. What a loving king Jesus is. Aren't you thankful for Jesus this morning. Let's pray and thank God for sending Jesus. Father, we thank you for the gift of your son. We thank you for the gift of salvation that we don't deserve, that we cannot earn, but that you so freely give to us. 
thank you for loving us the way you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Amy. So let's just take a minute and take in this week's banner, last week's, uh, last week's banner, and the first week's banner. There's one yet to come. As Nancy Elliott has helped interpret visually uh, our sermon series, Advent sermon series, I so appreciate her work and the, the beauty. I, I'm just so uh, mesmerized as she visualizes what we're trying to uh, understand from, from this passage. So I appreciate her work and just notice that uh, as she uh, continues to bring us beauty into our sanctuary. We sing now the very familiar Joy to the World uh, this Sunday. Uh, a Sunday of joy, joy Sunday, God a Sunday. Uh, and so we sing with great joy as we anticipate the birth of Christ. Let's again stand and sing together, joy to the world.
Your Isabel family is going to come now and light our Advent candles. I'm Andrew, this is Olivia, and our daughter Finley. Today we will be lighting the third candle of Advent. The candle symbolizes joy. Isaiah 61, 1-3 says, The Spirit of the Lord is, God, is, the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planning of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Let us pray. Father, you make known to us the path of life, and in your presence there is fullness of joy. Your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's what you say in Psalm 16, 13, 11. Fill our lives with great joy as we turn to Jesus in faith and lead us to sow joy where there is sorrow. Amen. We sing now two carols uh, together. They're not written together. They are separated by centuries. Uh, joy has dawned as new er in the corpus of all the songs that are being written. Keith Getty, Stuart Townend, uh, wrote this song to give us a modern uh, treatment to uh, the Christmas story. They wanted to kind of tell the story in the course of their verses, and you'll see that, like many of our Christmas carols have done through the years. But when they wrote this new song, uh, Keith Getty says that he always envisioned that it would be sung with angels we have heard on high, and so we will do that. It'll just immediately follow uh, the singing of this song. They relate, he thinks, uh, thematically as they tell the story of the birth of Christ and why Christ was born. So we'll sing both of these back to back, Joy Has Dawned and then Angels We Have Heard on High. Please stand. Let's sing together.
remain standing just for a moment. We'll read our scripture. But children, you're dismissed to Children's Church at this time. As the choir is coming down and as the children are going out, I invite you, if you have your copy of God's Word, you can turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We'll be reading one verse this morning, verse 9. Listen to these words. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So we've been using a Christmas Carol, Charles Dickens' classic, as a guide and as a window into the Christmas season, the Advent season. Uh, There's actually another Christmas classic uh, that I'd like to share a little bit with you this morning. And as the story goes, after he stole all the Christmas presents from down in Whoville, the Grinch took the gifts to the top of Mount Crumpet, intending to dump it off the cliff. And he paused there in order to stop and to hear the wailing and the crying of the who's who have awoken to no gifts and no decorations. And Dr. Seuss says something like this. They're just waking up. I know just what they'll do. Their mouths will hang open a minute or two. Then the who's down in Whoville will all cry boo-hoo. But there's a twist, isn't there? It's not the sound that the Grinch heard from the top of the mountain. The sound wasn't sad, but merry. So every who in Whoville, from the tall to the small, was what? Singing. Without any presence at all. The Grinch hadn't stopped Christmas. It came, it came, it came all the same. Now that's a good story, right? In the place, like it is perfect, in the place of expected weeping, there is instead a deeper truth at work. So in the place of expected wailing and crying, there is there a turn and an unexpected joy. I want you to think with me for a moment. Uh, The families that have been lighting the Advent candles during the season have all been reading a portion from the prophet Isaiah. I love Isaiah because... In the book of Isaiah, this prophet looking into life and history, he rescues us by a God-given word from this sort of cold reading of history. Like, so you could read like, all of your life and all of history and all the things that are happening in kind of a cold kind of way. You know, like, kind of like the, we wake up, we do a whole bunch of stuff, stuff happens to us, we go back to sleep. Like, we can kind of narrate life that way, can't we? And in, in the good times and the bad times, we woke up, we did a bunch of stuff, stuff happened to us, we went back to sleep, on and on and on and on and on again until we're born, until we die, stuff happened. But that's not Isaiah. Isaiah says, look here, God is moving. Your life is not like that at all. There are layers of God reality all around you, and the prophet Isaiah says, now I'm going to clue you into those. And so Isaiah 61, which was read today, When God comes near, when we can see these layers of God reality, there is a great reversal that happens. Reversal of fortunes, reversal of status, reversal of your future, of consequences, reversing the very flow of the human heart, reversing the flow of cynicism and darkness, reversing the flow of history. This was read for us. When the Lord comes near, you will exchange your ashes for beauty. How about that? It's the kind of thing that happens when a good and holy God rolls up his sleeves and when a good and holy God puts his thumbprints on all of the world. So we think again about 
2 Corinthians 8 9. Here's another translation here for you. Like our scripture, this is from the message translation. You are familiar with the generosity of our master, Jesus Christ. Rich as he was, he gave it all away for us. In one stroke, he became poor, and we became rich. As we think about Charles Dickens' story, uh, the, A Christmas Carol, stave three, right? so I'm not saying that wrong, the, the story's not broken down into chapters, but into staves, it's a musical term, it's like a stanza. So stanza three of A Christmas Carol, A Christmas Song, picks up with this idea of this great reversal. When the second spirit visits old Ebenezer Scrooge, the ghost of Christmas present visits him. So a quick synopsis to bring you up to speed. Ebenezer Scrooge is a miserly, miserable man. He's wearing the chains of his greed. We find out he's a cold, dead man, although he's still living. And he's visited on Christmas Eve by the ghost of his deceased business partner, Jacob Marley. Jacob Marley is wearing chains upon his ghostly figure, and he says to Scrooge, Scrooge, you wear these chains, you just don't see them yet. Your future is like mine unless something happens. He says, and here's the good news. You'll be haunted by three spirits. And so Scrooge has already been haunted by the first spirit, the ghost of Christmas past who walked Scrooge through his painful and pivotal moments in his life, explaining the why of, why of who Scrooge is. And then comes the second spirit, the ghost of Christmas present. Now, this is a fun chapter. I want to read to you just from Charles Dickens' work this initial description of Scrooge meeting the ghost of Christmas present. Uh, it's a scene inside Scrooge's home, and here's some depictions of uh, just from different ways of what this, uh, this character would have looked like. But let me read to you just a little bit. And I want you to kind of think, like, uh, Charles Dickens, I think, appears to love to describe food. Like, and I, I'm kind of the same way. Like, I have friends, we exchange, like, group texts when we eat out somewhere. Like, hey, here's the food we're eating. Or, you know, you take a picture of your food and put it on Instagram. We all get this. Dickens was way ahead of us on this. So listen to this. Uh, it was in his, room, in his own room, there was no doubt about that, but it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceilings were so hung with living green that it looked like a perfect grove from every part of it which brightly gleaming berries glistened. The crisp leaves of holly, mistletoe, and ivy reflected back the light as if so many little mirrors had been scattered there, and such a mighty blaze went roaring up in the chimney as that dull petrification of a hearth had never known in Scrooge's time, or Marley's, or for many, many a winter season's gone. Heaped up on the floor to form a kind of throne, I love this, this is like a throne of food. Is this not great? Um, kind, of, kind of a throne, uh, pick up here, were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, Great joints of meat, suckling pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, cherry-cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelfth cakes, and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with their delicious steam. In easy state upon his couch there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a, glo a glowing torch in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and held it up high up to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. Come in, exclaimed the ghost. Come in and know me better, man. I'm the ghost of Christmas present, said the spirit. Look upon me. And this is what Scrooge looks upon and sees. Scrooge reverently did so. It was clothed in one simple deep green robe or mantle bordered with white fur. This garment hung so loosely on the figure that its capacious breast was bare as if disdaining to be warded off or concealed by any artifice. Its feet, observable beneath the ample folds of the garment, were also bare, and on its head it, it wore no other covering than a holly wreath, set there and there with shining icicles. Its dark brown curls were long and free, free as its genial face, its sparkling eyes, its open hand, its cheery voice, its unconstrained demeanor, and its joyful air. Girded around its middle was an antique scabbard, but no sword was in it, and the ancient sheath, was catch up with rust. It's the ghost of Christmas present. So this is that scene, much like you might look at on the Christmas season in better homes and garden, a throne piled high of food and holly everywhere and just greenery everywhere and light shining from his torch. So 
Scrooge takes hold of the robe of the ghost of Christmas present, and they take a tour of Scrooge's present Christmas day. And this tour that they take together is surprising to Scrooge. I would say he goes through a series of unexpected scenes as they move from place to place, places where you don't regularly conjure thoughts of cheer or of joy, but there's surprising joy there. There's surprising riches of love found there, and unexpected and hardly comprehensible to Ebenezer. And so they move. We'll kind of take a little tour here. They move through the city streets and the marketplace. You have neighbors shoveling snow from the house and walkways, and they're jovial and full of glee. They're in the best humor possible, uh, Dickens says. And church bells ring from the steeples, and all, are, all the good people are called to church and chapel. They flock into the streets in their best clothes and their gayest faces. There's a movement even from there as they move back home for dinners together and shops and churches close and they prepare for those dinners. And Scrooge notices something here, that as there's passers-by with their dishes going to dinner, the ghost of Christmas present sprinkles a kind of incense from his torch on the baked goods as they go by. And Scrooge asks the ghost of Christmas present uh, how it decides on whom to sprinkle from what he calls his torch of goodwill. So he's sprinkling kind of from his torch of goodwill on passers-by. And the answer is, to any kindly given... To the poor one most, and Scrooge asks, why a poor one most? And the ghost says, because it needs it most. And this really even tucked in this chapter is a reflection of the heart of God. This is not a new idea that God comes to the aid of those in need. God shows favor to the poor and disenfranchised against the human tendency to favor the wealthy and the powerful. You can even think about the words of Jesus in the New Testament. Jesus locates the responsibility to his disciples to care for the lowly, care for the insignificant, care for the unimportant in the world's eyes. And Jesus says, when you care for those like that, you reveal yourself to truly be my disciples. You reveal that you truly belong to the kingdom. And he says words like this, that what you have done for the least of these, my brothers, you've done for me. The scenes keep moving and on that Christmas eve- evening. They visit a miner's cottage, those who labor in the bowels of the earth. Dickens says there's an old man and an old woman and generations assembled around a fire, and the old man, the old miner, sang a Christmas song, and the others joined in. And you love that, don't you? They go out among the rocks and the waves to a solitary lighthouse, and there's two lighthouse keepers there at a table together. They join in a Christmas toast. They wish each other Merry Christmas. And though they are worn in appearance from life out on the coast, one strikes up a Christmas song and they sing together. Then they go out to a ship at sea. And Scrooge is surprised that in the hard and dark places like out on the sea, there's among the sailors humming of Christmas tunes. There's sharing of fond remembrances of the past. There's kinder words exchanged with one another out there in that hard and dark place than any other time of the year. And they visit many homes that day and that night, always with a happy end. But you likely remember in this passage, they visit also the home of Bob Cratchit, Scrooge's poor clerk. And there's also this figure, like we can't, we can't really ever separate Ebenezer Scrooge from the story of Christmas Carol, but there's another figure in A Christmas Carol that we really can't get out of our minds that we probably associate with the story. You know who it is? It's Tiny Tim. And we love Tiny Tim. And we love his family. Dickens describes it this way. They were not a handsome family. They were not well-dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty, and Peter, one of Scrooge's sons, might have known and very likely did the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. If you think back to this scene, it's just everything you love in this scene in Bob Cratchit's home. There's an older daughter who comes home to visit for Christmas. There's a boy, one of his sons, uh, dressed in such an ill-fitting hand-me-down shirt from his parent that his large collar dips over into the saucepan when he leans over. There's young ones dancing around the table. At one point, they bring out a Christmas goose, and there's squeals, and there's joy. There's a table preparation made. There's hoorays, hurrahs as the goose is carved. The Christmas pudding comes out, which is different than our pudding, as I understand it, steaming from the copper. 
a picture of joy there. And then Tiny Tim, we understand Tiny Tim to have some disease working on his body, rendering his frame weak and crippling him. And that disease seems to be advancing with really the family having not enough money for the right kind of treatment. And you get the picture that his disease is advancing, that Tim is actually in the process, a long process of dying. And when he and Bob arrived back home to this meal from church, he reported that tiny Tim had done some deep thinking while at church. There's a quote that will be here on the screen for us, but uh, tiny Tim thought it would be good that the people in church that day, they might see a crippled child in church. Because he says it might be pleasant on Christmas Day to remember who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. And Charles Dickens, through the voice of Tiny Tim, draws our attention to Jesus Christ. Tiny Tim, though small in frame and crippled and weak, is a spiritual giant in the story. He speaks of Jesus in the most glowing way. It might be good to remember in the coming of Jesus at Christmas, in the coming of the Christ, that makes all the difference. He is the one who will reverse the curse, seen in making lame walk and blind men see, but reversing the curse of all of sin and all of death. And at the table, they wish each other a Merry Christmas. God bless us. Remember the words? Tiny Tim echoes back. God bless us, everyone. What is the explanation for Bob Cratchit's home, poor as they are? Christmas is there. What is the explanation for the city streets and the shops and the miner's home and the lighthouse and the sailors on the ship and the hard and dark places? What's the explanation for the joy there? Christmas is there. It is a puzzle confounding to Scrooge. There's an upside-down joy about Christmas. What is the explanation for all of this? Well, Dickens would say Christmas is there, but you know in the story he's using Christmas as a synonym for Christ. What is the explanation of all of this? Christ is there. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 is one of my favorite summaries of the Christmas story. It's actually one of my favorite summaries of the gospel. And it's not really about the events of Christmas and Mary and Joseph and donkeys and camels and hay and a manger and things like that. It's more really about the meaning of Christmas than telling the story. It's about the heart of Christmas at the very middle of all the events. And we've been walking through this together, and we think about the very heart of Christmas this morning. We think about Scrooge taking this tour, and if we just use this as a window into Jesus and a window into the Scripture and a window into the Gospel, we think about maybe some confounding lessons that Scrooge learned on that Christmas tour, that because of Christmas, or let's say it more clearly, because of Christ, here are some confounding things. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 tells us that because of Christ, the poor become rich. So the poor become rich. Is this some sort of get-rich-quick scheme? Well, I would say if you're following the real Jesus, No. <laughs> Does it mean that a little bit of faith will put a little bit of coin in my pocket? No, that's for a different kind of gospel. The poor become rich. We're talking about salvation. We're talking about the riches of salvation. Paul uses this rich-poor dynamic to tell of the rescue story of Jesus. And we can, we can wrap our minds around this. To be poor, what better phrase to illustrate the stranglehold of sin in the world? To be powerless, to be vulnerable, the spiritual nature of every person apart from Christ. It's about the power of sin, the chains of sin, corrupting all of life and all relationships. And that's what it is to be a sinner on a deep soul level to be impoverished. And at Christmas, we find this great exchange that we live by Jesus' reversal of all things. This means that Jesus underwent in his incarnation and coming and taking on human flesh. He became poor, Paul says. And in spite of his position in heaven, the fact that he was rich, in order that we might be saved, so our salvation through Jesus' death means our becoming rich 
through his lowering and through his poverty. And Jesus did not give out just what he could spare. Jesus didn't give out his riches, out of his riches, he gave away his riches. Jesus didn't give just because he had power to spare. He gladly lost all of his power. He gladly completely became vulnerable for us. And so on the cross, Jesus took the ultimate poverty to reverse the fortunes of those impoverished in sins. This is the gospel message. And so Scrooge is perplexed by the scenes of joyful people on Christmas because Scrooge doesn't understand the resources that they draw from, the durable riches that they live from, that they're able to live above their circumstances, that they have among them this gospel-born, superabounding joy. Because Jesus took the ultimate weeping, that someday we might laugh with him, endless enjoyment of him forever. Jesus took the ultimate darkness so that we might live in God's light and in his presence. Jesus took our distance from God so we might be near to God, to be given a home with him, have overflowing joy and acceptance through the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus bore our sin and the, and the wrath of God for other sins, not his own, that by grace we are loved and secure eternally with God. This is enough for Ray Ortland, pastor and theologian, to tell us that the flavor of Christianity, what does that taste in your mouth when you're a Christian? The flavor of Christianity is joy. And why wouldn't it be the poor become rich in Christ? Sort of the second confounding lesson that Scrooge has on this tour of Christmas Day, because of Christ, because of Christmas, the rich become poor. You know, Scrooge did not expect to find joy among the places that he stopped. And in Bob Cratchit's home, he finds something even less likely than joy. Forgiveness is what he finds. Do you remember the story? At the table, Bob Cratchit proposes a toast to the founder of the feast, and you will never expect the name that comes out of his mouth. Toast to Mr. Scrooge. After all, he works for him. He pays his salary. And Cratchit's wife will have none of it. She didn't want any part of that. And he keeps reminding her, my dear, Christmas Day. To rattle off a little bit more, my dear, Christmas Day. You know, Bob Cratchit is a light. It means that there is another way. Scrooge is rich enough, you would think, to be happy. You would think. Cratchit barely scraping by, yet his home radiates. And his home radiates not without difficulty, not going to sell you on that, not without affliction, but his home radiates with warmth and love and joy and light. Scrooge is evermore scraping and cold and in darkness and joyless, and Cratchit is here in this scene, generous to Scrooge in his poverty. And we're told the family goes along with it, I'm just kind of playing the part here, but it's the only part of the meal that has no heartiness to it. They understand firsthand how Scrooge's grasping greediness has inflicted suffering upon them. And they drink the toast still. Every one of them drinks it down. There's nothing quite as sobering as someone forgiving you. This is perhaps a forgiveness that Scrooge didn't even know that he needed. We think through the scriptures that salvation by grace does that, doesn't it? Paul speaks to us in 2 Corinthians 8 of a costly personal exchange of Jesus. This is a very non-sentimental reading of the Christmas story. Jesus, rich as he was, gave it all away. And only through his extreme poverty, going all the way down, could the poor like us become rich in salvation. It is sobering. And among all of us, there's probably this relentless, exhausting bent towards self-salvation, and the Christmas story says, no, 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 no. Your salvation only comes by a meteorite of God's grace striking your life. So Jesus came all the way down. He became poor. It lets us know that wherever we are, you cannot be so low that Jesus cannot come down and find you. You cannot be so far away that Jesus can't, cannot reach you. But it does remind us that us, that we in our sin, we are so low. We are so far away. 
Tim Keller, in his wonderful book, Hidden Christmas, says this, If Christianity is something done for you and to you and in you, then there's a constant note of surprise and wonder. John Newton wrote a hymn that says this, Let us love and sing in wonder. Let us praise the Savior's name. He has hushed the law's loud thunder. He has quenched Mount Sinai's flame. He has washed us in his blood. And there's a repeat there. He has washed us in his blood. He has brought us near to God. We see where love and wonder comes from. Because he has not done all this and brought us, because he has done all this and brought us to himself. He has done it. There should be no of courseness about it. It would be more appropriate to say, yes, yes, I am a Christian, and that's a miracle. Me, a Christian, who would have ever thought it? Yes, he did it, and I am his. And salvation follows this pattern of Jesus' incarnation. The rich must become poor. This is a get-poor-quick scheme, really. That on a deep soul level, we must humble ourselves to enter into the salvation of Jesus. We must look upon how bankrupt we are we must, in, in order to look upon the Savior. You know, Jesus in his earthly ministry, he, he had these kind of one-liners or two-liners, you might call them. And the Beatitudes and the, the sermons that he preached, he said something like this, Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. What would that mean? Well, something like this, as Eugene Peterson translated, you're blessed when you've lost it all. God's kingdom is there for the finding. We end here. You know, our, our lives have to follow this pattern of Jesus, though he was rich, becoming poor. Our lives have to follow this pattern of the rich become poor. We humble ourselves. We see our poverty. And in doing so, in that poverty of spirit, salvation comes. We become rich. And that kind of richness in Christ has to get converted into generosity. So we learn also here that the rich to poor to rich become generous. You know, Scrooge also makes a visit to the home of his nephew, Fred, with the ghost of Christmas present. Maybe you remember Fred from the story. We haven't talked a lot about him. He's the nephew of Scrooge's deceased sister, little fan. Fred is the embodiment of Christmas joy. He speaks of Christmas in every sense in the most glowing terms. Fred has this infectious laughter. And in his home, that home is again filled with light and warmth and merriment at a Christmas party. And Fred's role in this, and you see from Fred, he is the one who relentlessly tries to bring his Uncle Scrooge out of his cold, dark isolation. There's even part of the talk at, at Fred's Christmas party, and Fred just says, I went to him again this year. I see that his suffering is self-inflicted, so I go to him year after year. I went last year. I went this year. I'm going to go next year and perhaps shake him loose. But regardless of what happens, I'll go to him again. I'll keep going. There's an interesting note about Fred in the story, and we're told uh, from those closest to Charles Dickens, his friends and his children, that they believe that Charles Dickens wrote himself into A Christmas Carol as the character Fred. So many years ago, uh, C.S. Lewis, a great author and Christian thinker, uh, he wrote a response to something that the Soviets did. The Soviets put the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin, uh, to orbit, you know. Uh, and so uh, there's comments that followed from the Soviet government. It's kind of a propaganda win for communism and atheism. And they said something like this. We went into the heavens, outer space. We went up there. God wasn't there. We didn't find him, Right? And C.S. Lewis responded with something like this. That would be like Hamlet going to the attic of a castle looking for Shakespeare. It's not where you find him. But for Hamlet to know the author of his story, Shakespeare, personally, intimately, the author would have to write himself into the story. For the two to meet, it would have to be Shakespeare's doing. And this is the basic claim of the Christian narrative. There's an author and a creator of everything. There's an author of our story and our world. And if we would ever meet him, he would have to come to us. He must act. 
He must write himself into human history. And really the only way to know how the creator wanted us to live would be for him to write himself into the story. And we think about Christmas now. We think about the Christmas story. How did God write himself into the story? Here's how he wrote himself in. Though he was rich, he became poor. So that through his poverty, we become rich. The incarnation means that God was willing to empty himself of his glory and of his power. And Jesus was willing to live humbly as a servant. To live a life of costly, humble servant. To live a life to forgive. And our lives are meant to imitate the generosity of our Savior and pass it on to others. There is your Christmas assignment. To imitate the one who wrote himself into our story. A couple closing thoughts, and then we're going to sing a great song of joy. So just get ready. We're ramping that way. All right? I love the song we're about to sing. I just love it. I just love it. A couple closing thoughts and applications. How might we imitate the generosity of our Savior and pass it on? Well, we could forgive. Forgiveness is to release someone from a debt. We're not going to go into a long teaching here, but the reality for all of us is that we know, we know at this very moment, No one has to convince you of it. You know. There's a resentment you're holding on to. There's a harm wishing towards some person you're holding on to. And to forgive, you have to get low. You have to get poor to release them. And to take even that next step, not only internally releasing them, but seeking reconciliation. Who can you forgive today? We also bear with one another. Author Wendell Berry has written about the need in meaningful, small communities. Think about this, like a church, like a church, like this. In meaningful, small communities where people are highly dependent upon one another, he wrote about a need for a kind of prepaid forgiveness among among one another. To know that to live life up close, we will inevitably offend or wrong And so we just keep this prepaid forgiveness, this bearing with one another, close by like a fire extinguisher. We can do that, can't we? Can we be generous in that way? And of course, to sacrificially give. And that is really the focus of the whole passage in 2 Corinthians 8, to find regular and strategic, strategic ways to disperse money for the ministry of the gospel, for worldwide mission, to open our eyes and see our neighbor in need and just do something about it. The Christmas story tells us to move toward our neighbors with humble, costly service to the practical needs of others. And here's how we do it. Because of the durable riches we have in Christ, that we have among us this gospel-born, super-abounding joy that we are living in a world opened wide by our Savior. You know, these are challenging assignments. We do so with great joy. Let's pray, and then we'll sing of that joy together. Father, we love you. and Father, we praise you that you've buried deep within our hearts your joy. And so we sing our praise to you. We act out our praise to you in all that we do. Father, may we accept humbly your assignment. Live like Jesus Christ. We pray this in your name. Amen. We sing How Great Our Joy, found in your hymnal 202, or the words will be on the screen. Please stand. Let's sing together.
may be seated. Isn't that song great? I just love it. Like, I know I've talked to you before about, like, country hymns and city hymns. This is a city hymn, but I got to the city one day, and they were singing, like, joy, joy. I guess it's great. I love it. Sing the songs, people. They're wonderful. Hey, a couple of reminders as we go out of worship this morning. Uh, we are in a season of giving toward our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Our goal as a church is $30,000, and really a little bit below the average we've given over several, several years now. Um, and so uh, you, can, you can give toward that. Those funds go directly uh, to fund uh, international uh, missionaries throughout the world and the spreading of the gospel. Uh, you're also invited to give this morning as you are weekly as an act of worship of your tithes and your offerings. You can do that by putting those in the offering plates located behind you in the foyer. Uh, there is, uh, this season, there's an RA mailbox at the end of the hallway near the fellowship hall. You can exchange Christmas cards there, so you're invited into that. Um, also, uh, out in the foyer behind you, we are doing a family ornament exchange again this year. The, the idea is simply from your home, or you go out and buy, however you want to do that. You bring an ornament that represents your family. You can write your name on it. Or we have tags out there. You can tag your name on it. You put it on the Christmas tree. Somebody at the end of the season will take that off the Christmas tree and take it to their home, and they'll commit to praying for you or your family uh, for all of 2023. So, uh, if you did one last year, bring a different one, okay? We're not, we're not exchanging the same ones again. So put your name on it. Somebody will take it home and pray for you. And so we'll do that at the end of the season. There are, uh, there's something happening tonight. Uh, and, and really, it's called Carols in the Courtyard, but it is our annual church Christmas fellowship. Listen, you don't want to miss it, all right? I don't want to overdo it here. But it's kind of like the description of Scrooge's house with the ghost of Christmas present, all right? There's going to be a big throne of food, metaphorically speaking, of course. But there are some surprises uh, for our children tonight. Perhaps a man in a red suit will be there, right? Who might that be? Who knows? Who knows? There'll be some opportunities for a photo booth. And then, Lord willing, just pray for the rain to never come back again, at least until tomorrow, um, <laughs> ever. Uh, uh, in, the, in the night, we're just some beautiful singing in our courtyard together, some surprises out there. If you like fire, there will be candles, so... I'm just trying to get you in the door, all right? So please come out tonight at 5 p.m. Uh, for that event and for caroling at the end of that in our courtyard together. What am I forgetting? Who knows? Uh, but read your bulletin. It will help you greatly. And if you would, let's stand and let's sing our benediction. May your old lang syne, and we'll sing that first stanza. You'll see the words on the screen. dismissed.